Hello, and welcome back to Av Imperator Productions. Today, we're going to have our first look at Western and Northern Europe as they rose from societal collapse and bridged the Middle and Early Modern periods. The bulk of this episode will be on the Low Countries, today's the Netherlands, Belgium, and Luxembourg, but this part of the series will be more generally dedicated to the 14th to 17th centuries, roughly. Why pick the Low Countries as a starting point for Western Europe's reclamation of the Western civilization mantle? This relatively small area went through violent and ambitious change and upheaval throughout this time, changing possession between various states for centuries before finally getting fed up and building a nation and empire of their own. You may have heard someone say something like, Amsterdam is sinking into the ocean, and it is, as it naturally should. The Low Countries are a man-made area, built upon an ages-old swamp. Without human intervention, it naturally would be little more than water and the occasional hydrophilic plant. There was an old saying, God made the earth, but the Dutch made Holland. We'll get into polders and how the Dutch literally made their own country in a bit, but first, I want to briefly go over how this area became what it was to better explain their mindset and perspective. I don't want to go too far back, so we'll start at around 400 AD, right before the collapse of Western Rome. West Rome did not directly govern every province that was under their control, having several mostly autonomous subject states at their fringe. A group of Germans pushed west early in the migration period, the Franks, crossing the Rhine, fleeing brutality from other tribes, mother nature, and god knows what else. The Roman state was still fairly secure at this point, and didn't want a large body of foreigners wandering through their soft inner lands. The Roman state was, however, already showing signs of weakness, and some areas' populations uh, faltered and waned over time. One such area was the border crossing at the North Rhine, a swampy mess thought to be mostly uninhabitable, where today's low countries now are, with some of the highest population density on Earth. Rome was having many troubles associated with decadence, increased corruption, lowered public confidence, higher taxes, and politicians and emperors who cared for little beyond their own interest. Roman citizens began to feel the strain of a nation far flung from its original intent, serving no longer as a bastion of innovation but now simply a seat of power to be obtained and wielded for its own sake. Their law system became a joke. One emperor nailed his laws to the top of a hundred foot column so he could try people for breaking laws that he had made public. If that sounds crazy, it's really not too far off from today where hundred years ago or so, bills were, you know, four, five, ten pages and could be read by just about anybody who could read, and today they're four to five thousand pages and not even the people actually writing them or voting on them tend to read the thing in its entirety. The point on that is, if you can't read the law and the people around you can't read the law, how can you trust it? And, more than that, how can you trust those writing it? So, the Franks, hiding out from all manner of bad tidings, straddled two very different worlds in their new home on the north of the Rhine, between Roman subject and German outcast. The Franks did not want to be Roman. Most Romans didn't even really want that anymore. They also, however, had a taste of high culture and didn't want to go back completely into the darkness. To explain this, 
I'm going to try and divide the contemporary Roman and German cultures into higher order and lower order orientations. The Roman Empire had a history of striving for infinity, while the Germans would strive for tomorrow. What do I mean by this? There's another old saying, the poor Roman plays the barbarian, the rich barbarian plays the Roman. This shows how the corruption and concentration of power led to a state where the rich and powerful were supreme, and the poor were little more than statistics or a tax base. Take agriculture or manufacture, where the average Roman citizen during the Republican times had been a citizen farmer. This would no longer be true under the empire. Near the end, most agriculture was Roman villa style, where one guy owned a huge amount of land and worked it with slaves. As Rome fell and its population declined, the villas could not, no longer be filled as readily, and the Romans who no longer knew how to feed themselves would starve waiting for the state grain dole. The Germans, on the other hand, hadn't quite had the ability to dispose of mass amounts of people just to grow food the way that the Roman state could. They would have to rely on the citizen farmer, who would want to do whatever he could to produce the largest crop possible. Slaves working in a villa, essentially a plantation, wouldn't care to innovate or experiment with their cultivation. They would simply do the bare minimum to not get yelled at or whipped or killed or whatever. The point being, a poor German could care for himself, and a rich Roman could care for himself, but a rich German or poor Roman was on hard times. Back to the Franks. They didn't have the population to support Roman-style high-order society but didn't want to be illiterate and destitute once they saw there was another option. They dug into the little workable land that existed and crudely dumped dirt into the water where they could expand. As fate would have it, a man named Stilicho was all that stood between the West and Oblivion. He fought a flawless campaign beset by political intervention and sabotage until finally, some rich guys and some powerful people got too jealous and upset over his accomplishment and his half-barbarian blood. They relieved him of command after unwarranted and lengthy scrutiny, replacing him with a string of terrible commanders who would make them feel comfortable, sure, but they would also ensure the loss of Western Rome forever. There will be a special episode on Stilicho, the last Western Roman general, but for now, just understand that Roman special interests colluded to sabotage the only man who could have postponed, or better, the collapse due to jealousy and corruption. With this, the Roman state acknowledged its turn against its own citizens and their security, the two basic reasons people coalesced to form governments in the first place. The Roman state was keeping many of these people alive, and this betrayal, when coupled with invasion, a changing climate, disease, and all those other frightful things of the time, led to massive depopulation, especially of the cities and reaches of the empire. Gaul, today's France, was quickly abandoned after Rome's exit of England, and soon everything fell. As the Roman government continuously redrew their own borders inwards and left their former citizens out to die, more tribes pushed west and settled, but they all wanted the fertile lands of the Roman interior. The Franks, who had been biding their time in the swampy northern reaches of the Rhine, had been mostly passed over as various hordes poured through. The Franks were already an established culture due to years of proximity and trade with Rome, and with the withdrawal of Rome's armies, their expansion south to Gaul would go mostly smoothly, taking in lands abandoned and ravaged alike. 
Although saying Rome collapsed in 476 AD sounds clean and final, it's not entirely accurate. Three regions of the Western Roman Empire, Soissons in Gaul, Venice in Northern Italy, and some of Southern Italy to uh, Sicily and Calabria specifically, which were Byzantine possessions for a few centuries, would continue the Roman tradition, but only Venice would be saved from tragedy and go on to thrive. So we saw it would be integrated into the Frankish kingdom, transitioning the Franks from a tribal organization to a kingdom poised for expansion. Southern Italy had been abandoned in favor of Northern Italy for West Romans, but held on through as a Byzantine possession until the rise of Islam. Slavery was a pretty integral part of Islam for the majority of its history, and drove them to slave in southern Italy when it was close, and other areas when they were close as well, including France and West Africa. As people fled north to escape the Islamic slavers and raiders, the south became depopulated and therefore unproductive, a sad demographic trend that can actually still be seen in modern Italy today. A night outpost was set up on Malta for interception, but there were far too many slavers to stop them all. Calabria and Sicily would soon also, like Soissons, be little more than a footnote in history. But of the successor states to Western Rome, the one I really want to look at here is Venice. As I mentioned previously, Rome had moved its capital to Mediolanum, modern-day Milan, in the north, and much of its population along with it. The river Po had several cities dotting it and lots of Romans, and with the push of the Vandals and other tribes through the Alps, many of these people began to look for alternatives to dismemberment and supplantation. Just off the coast of the Adriatic in northern Italy, was a swampy little lagoon, soon to be the great city of Venice. Some enterprising and forward-thinking citizens started moving to this area near the western collapse, clinging to what little land was exposed above the sea. The land had been previously uninhabited and uncharted, with shallow rivers and confusing navigation which kept it safe from the catastrophe on the mainland. As the progenitor Venetians became entrenched, they invited dispossessed Romans to their lagoon, who set to work shoring up the land and over time quite literally building an island in late antiquity to escape tragedy. They decided Rome's chief failure was its switch to empire, and established a republic for merchants and guildsmen, vying for trade dominance for close to 1,000 years before the unification of Italy. And again, back to the Franks. With the collapse of the West, the Franks annexed much of Northwest Europe, what is today the Low Countries and Northern France. They were stopped at their southern expansion by the Soissons, another Roman successor state in southern France. The Soissons carried over much of Roman ideal, but failed to adapt to the new conditions of the Middle Ages. The Franks had their German advantages of population, agricultural practice, and other lower order advancements, and had begun to fully encompass the old Roman higher order advancements of language, law, sanitation, and learning as well. The Soissons, beset by peoples who hated them as much as their predecessors, would fall with the organization and solidification of these higher order ideals in what was now called Francia. But this video isn't about Francia so I have to do my best to not linger here too long. As Francia absorbed the Soissons, their leaders desired justification for their rule. In the East, Byzantium claimed emperor status from history and authority, the Franks only having half of that. 
the capital was moved interior to a more administratively and militarily friendly location, an island on the beautiful Seine River. A mighty walled city would be constructed to represent the grand ambition of Francia. No longer would her people live in sticks and straw, but stone. Well, some of them, anyways. With this decision, Paris was born, and would become a major political and cultural center for a very long time indeed. I bring up the formation of Paris to illustrate how Francia began to take south and west with expansion, Aachen being another seat of power. Why is this important? Well, while the Franks had been confined to the Low Countries, they had been prodigious in their claiming of that land, going way beyond the Venetians raising their island from a lagoon. The estuaries, riverbanks, marshes, and swamps were filled, levied, and blocked off by dikes, producing polders, low-lying areas of fertile land that used to be totally useless. If anyone ever says that they don't know of any great works of construction or engineering from the Middle Ages, show them a map of Holland. The advantage to polders was twofold. Not only did you get access to rich land, which had never been touched, but out of necessity from water diversion, you also got superior and highly functional irrigation. Anyone with a polder had access to top quality irrigation from manual stations, if you had the resources to construct a polder, that is. This practice became even more effective when coupled with another fantastic Middle Age invention, three-field rotation. Instead of half your land doing nothing all year, which was the standard two-field rotation, now you would divide it into three, and they soon also discovered that one-third could be used to uh, farm legumes, which would fix nitrogen into the soil. So, a couple hundred years ago, you could only farm about half of your land at any one time without killing it effectively. Now, you could farm 100% of your land, year-round. So, relative to the rest of Western Europe, the Low Countries had a boom in cities and thus population due to polders, irrigation, and three-field rotations. Surplus food leads to specialization and societal development, and through contact with other trade-oriented cultures in Italy and further east, the Low Countries produced fine goods like textiles and art. They became the envy of Francia, even as the seats of power grew further away. When the Frankish emperors would die, they would split up their domain, or their lands, among their sons, who would usually kill each other trying to claim the entire realm. Everyone wanted the Low Countries, and on the final partition of Francia, there was three entities, West Francia, to become modern France, Central Francia, which was the Low Countries and a strip between modern France and Germany, and East Francia, which was most of Central Europe. West Francia, beset by invasion, plague, slavers, and various other woes, attempted to consolidate their power in their king, setting the stage for France and their motions towards absolutism. East Francia, didn't suffer from quite the same woes, being further from the most hostile parties and stronger in manpower, and regularly fended off Northmen invasions and kept on Byzantium's good side when it could. The many princes of East Francia essentially staged a coup and demanded reformation of their state, from hereditary monarchy to elective monarchy. This meant a future emperor had to be chosen by his peer elector princes, rather than simply being born lucky, although that certainly wouldn't hurt. Central Francia consisted of the Low Countries and the strip of land which came to be known as Burgundy, ruled from Burgoyne and Lille in Central Europe. 
Burgundy saw themselves as competitors to France, but didn't really have the population or organization to take them on alone, and joined the Holy Roman Empire for protection. As the late Middle Ages ground on, the cities and provinces of the Low Countries developed unique languages, culture, and societal structure separate from the ruling Burgundian order. Burgundy kept the Low Countries as various states to keep them weak and disorganized, but in the end, this only encouraged a culture of competition and innovation which fed feelings of separateness. There was an explosion in immigration to the Low Countries from the Holy Roman Empire and France and even Burgundy itself, and the cities and provinces needed more and more autonomy to effectively manage their societies, which were quite alien to the royal courts. In fact, the Holy Roman Emperor could grant free imperial city status to a particularly successful place. A free imperial city would have its own government and be subject to no one but the emperor himself or herself, who was often too busy to care anyways. This insulated free cities from the squabbles of petty nobles and stupid dukes who might tax a city into oblivion for personal gain, stifling its growth and choking its citizens' rights. So why did people move to the Low Countries or any free imperial city? Let's say you're a middle-aged peasant, farming three plots of land and surfing it up. It's really not so bad. Half the year is religious holidays when work is forbidden. There are no alarm clocks and for the most part you work at whatever pace you feel comfortable. The church also requires the Eucharist be given to all peasants and most lords do so in the morning to ensure everyone attends. The Eucharist used to be a full meal and represent the Last Supper of Christ, so attendance tended to be boosted, who would turn down a free meal. By the way, this is also where the term breakfast comes from. This morning religious meal would break your fast between yesterday's dinner and today's lunch, which were the two primary meals of the ancient world. If you manage to have a just local authority and good fertile soil, peasanting it up might not be so bad, if you're bereft of ambition, of course. Peasants also weren't really a part of the military in any meaningful sense, and war was a preoccupation of the wealthy. But if you didn't have good authority, or good land, or either, life could be very hard. It may seem like a lowly peasant held no recourse if a brutal lord decided to make his life miserable through taxation and other fun interactive activities, but this isn't entirely true. Sure, he claimed you belong to your land as your ancestors did, but he's a Philistine and his concerns should be discarded. His rules won't apply in a free imperial city where you could be an artist or a craftsman, a farmer or a physician, something more than an owned farm implement. He may torture or kill you if you fail to escape, but if you succeed, you'll be a free human being. Would you run or kiss his jewels? So, you run and the periphery of the Holy Roman Empire is dotted with cities far from central authority and your old lord, masters of their own destiny, as you hope to be. The Low Countries weren't the only free imperial cities, but there were many there. This attraction of enterprising Europeans from all over Europe led to a mindset first fostered in the Low Countries by the polder makers and the early Franks. Innovation, risk and reward, and creativity were rewarded characteristics there rather than birth or past. As various countries like Muscovy, Venice, and other Italian cities 
took in Byzantine refugees during the Turkish invasions and eventual conquest, Roman learning and wisdom was returning in full to the former Western Roman lands, and through trade in Bruges in modern-day Belgium, the Low Countries sparked their own renaissance, as great as the Italian we all know, this being the Renaissance in the Low Countries. We'll have to look at the unification and formation of the United Provinces, the first successful nationalist insurrection against an obsolete power structure in Europe, at another time. I want to touch on the Renaissance in the Low Countries, and then do a brief thought experiment to try and keep this video relatively truncated. Although I very much painted in broad strokes so far this episode, I wanted to do some catch-up and paint a picture of how the Low Countries got to a renaissance in the first place, while also being subject to Burgundy, who was subject to the Holy Roman Empire, neither of which had similar movements contemporary to the Low Countries. Around the 14th century AD, the Low Countries had coalesced into various provinces and cities, and their population swelled due to low central authority, good agricultural practice, and safety from invasion geographically. Although France and the Holy Roman Empire would stage most of their wars on Low Country soil, in addition to many, many, many other wars, uh, using their lands as killing fields, the fields of Flanders. Their mastery of irrigation could be carried over to sanitation as well, relieving their swelling population from disease and famine. The surplus allowed complex society, and up to a third or more of their population was freed up to specialize in work other than agriculture. Merchants, guilds, priests and scholars, and importantly, artists. The first universities appeared in the Middle Ages of Europe. Universities coming from, you know, the word in Latin, universitas, after all. And the Low Countries got theirs in 1425. Why would artists be important? The Middle Ages was a time, like much of history, where many people were illiterate to various degrees. At the same time, the religious and social order, Christianity and the law, relied heavily on written record. How would people who couldn't read learn the stories of wisdom of old, or the saints and other great stories of their time? Well, you would grab some kid who called himself an artist, and have him paint or sculpt those stories in grand displays. You don't have to be literate to look at a painting, after all. The highest of these artists were court painters, meaning they attended a noble or religious court, where a powerful person made political and social decisions. As nobles grew in strength, court painters were commissioned to paint them into art, which was one reason religious paintings from the time look very Germanic in subject, rather than Mediterranean. They were portraits of rich people disguised as paintings of religious stories to hide their vanity. Art was very regulated then, as it basically always has been, as it is now, FCC, standards and practices, etc., and future artists would be required to shift artistic perspectives toward other subject matter. This contrasts with some other cultures who, rather than expanding the limits of art, chose to further divide and limit it. The Low Countries were among the first to paint ordinary scenes of peasants and regular folks. If a king could be painted without vanity, why not a peasant? Painting as a method of mass storytelling became a prime artistic method, and great painters of the time were a lot like movie producers today, telling intricate stories without requiring a whole lot of literacy. A peasant 
would have been as excited to see the Sistine Chapel or the Ghent altarpiece as a moviegoer today would be to see, like, Star Wars, I guess? Because of their mass appeal, court painters were highly sought after and regarded. In the Middle Ages, they didn't know about germs, but they knew dead bodies invited disease, so they strictly forbid people keeping dead bodies lying around. As the various renaissances of Europe rose, in the Low Countries, in Italy, in the North, etc., artists tried to figure out why their art wasn't looking, well, like real life. They eventually figured out they needed to grasp anatomy how the bones, organs, muscle, and skin affect how a person looks, rather than just their outer appearance. Doing this would require having a dead body to autopsy, which would go against the whole prohibition of dead bodies thing. The draw of better, prettier art was too tempting, and court painters too influential, and the prohibition was lifted, but generally only for artists and their attendants. One quick point on that. I said artists and their attendants. Michelangelo Bornerati, no, his last name wasn't Angelo, the mind behind the Sistine Chapel, did not sit on his back painting the whole thing, or with his arm outstretched even. In all likelihood, he painted very little of it himself. Rather, he had a team of attendants and students, 30 to 50 strong, who executed his will. He would later found a school which would help lead to mannerism, and many students would study art by literally tracing his paintings and others. Many early mannerist painters are almost indistinguishable from his style, especially since signing your work didn't exist as a concept yet. Great artists then were creative conduits, employing craftsmen, artists, and thinkers to materialize stories in their mind for mass consumption, again, much like the movie producers of today. So, to better understand the Renaissance in the Low Countries and the importance of painters at that time, Let's say you are a young and ambitious artist in what is today Belgium. Let's call you Jan Van Eyck. Let's say you move to The Hague to kick off your career, a city of splendor and intrigue. As you master anatomy and style, you work your way into an artist guild, from a lowly workshop assistant all the way up to having your very own workshop and your own assistant. As old Roman ways awaken, glass blowers revive and improve the old Roman glass making secrets, even creating mirror glass so pure that people can truly see themselves. Some glass blowers get cocky and start making convex and concave mirror glass, resulting in odd, warped images and new perspectives. You're painting a portrait of a man and a woman which qualified as a marriage certificate at that time, when you spot one such round mirror in the background and paint it, and subsequently yourself, into that work. This decision might seem trivial today, but you are the great Van Eyck, and triviality is not your speciality. This was one of the first paintings to include the areas beyond the four corners of the canvas, through breaking the fourth wall as we might know it today. So, to speak, you've stumbled on a new height of realism in art, which every artist of the time naturally claims to be doing, but has much less to show for it. The local lord of Holland takes note of your mastery and invites you to court to be his court artist. You agree and expand your workshop accordingly to your new patrons' much deeper pockets. You make friends at court, but the member you connect with the most is a scholar from a nearby university. Scholars then came in three flavors, religious, legal, and medical. 
This scholar is of the medical variety. And one night, you're about to leave court when the scholar pulls you aside and asks where you're headed. You tell him about a big upcoming project and explain that you need to go carve up a dead guy so your assistants can get a grip on anatomy for their art. The scholar laments about conversations with the Lord for lifting the ban on dead bodies for medical research, but doctors weren't really as trusted or useful as artists at that time, so his pleas went unheeded. He implores you to speak to the Lord on his behalf, but you don't think the authority would go for it personally. But you are the great Van Eyck, and you realize there may be another option, and you prepare to take a great risk. You instruct him to come with you, and to bring an apron. Back at your studio, you find a dead body on the table, as you should, and your students plus the scholar in attendance. You introduce the scholar as your new student, and then get on with the anatomy lesson. He rapidly takes notes with everyone else and blends in with your art students for the most part. The lesson goes well, and he thanks you for the opportunity. You invite him to future anatomy classes, and he accepts, taking notes and discreetly dispensing the knowledge at his university for the advancement of society. The Duke of Burgundy, Philip the Good, calls a private meeting with you and the scholar one day, and the jig is up. He knows the scholar isn't your student, and you two have been breaking the dead body prohibition. Ordinarily, he'd just kill the two of you, but you are the great Van Eyck, and he has had his eye on you and your work for some time now. He asks why you act disobediently, and you explain the medical scholar's desire for knowledge. Duke Philip listens, and then he explains he has a sick relative who's supposed to die soon, and is willing to make a deal. If the scholar and his physicians can nurse his relative away from death, you'd be his court painter and be free to continue your anatomy lessons, still in secret of course, so as to not insult his authority. If the scholar failed and Philip's relative dies, however, you would both suffer similar fates. The scholar and his physicians attend the relative and with their superior knowledge help her fever subside and her malady pass. Philip is greatly impressed and declares you will paint whenever you please and lavishes wealth and accolades upon you even allowing your underground anatomy lessons to continue. Um, by the way, this is sort of partially about Jan Van Eyck. I can't really prove that he was one of the first guys to use um, medical professionals in his sittings like this, but this was actually a practice that existed for some time in Western Europe. Um, it, this practice would continue for a few centuries until the ban was totally overturned or just outright ignored some painters in the 17th century would paint medical anatomy lessons that were being taught specifically by the physicians themselves, but because they were there in the background painting, it made it okay. Um, but you, the great Van Eyck, told great stories, not just for entertainment and uplifting, but to try to capture a truer perspective of life, and ended up changing the perspectives of others as you accomplished your goals. So that's it for now guys, thanks for watching. This episode has been a little more art than the previous ones to give you a taste of what it will be more like after the next episode when we restart the cycle. Next episode will be on the Age of Sail and the Enlightenment, the 17th to 19th centuries roughly and will be the final period we look at once the main show cycle has complete. Uh, I'll probably have some special episodes on some things from 1850 and on uh, eventually, but that will come later. Okay, I hope you enjoyed. If you did, why not share this with your friends or leave a like. Uh, feel free to comment any questions, suggestions, or anything else. 
I hope to see you all again soon, but until then, remember, Av Imperator.